My name is Elwin Burlekamp, and now I'm going to tell you about a fascinating combinatorial game called Domineering. It can be played on boards of many sizes and shapes, such as this initially empty 8x7 board. A more popular starting position is this 8x8 chess board. I'll now show you a sample game between two players. Each player begins with a bountiful supply of dominoes. At his turn, one player, called blue, must place a domino vertically on any empty adjacent pair of squares. The other player, called red, must place a domino horizontally on any empty adjacent pair of squares. Once played, the dominoes have no color. The players continue to alternate moves until eventually someone is unable to play at their turn. The game then ends and the player who is unable to play loses. In his Scientific American column in November 1974, Martin Gardner reported that he had learned this game in 1973 from its inventor, a man named Goran Anderson. For many reasons which I will explain in later segments, the game of domineering has attracted considerable interest from combinatorial game theorists. It has become the source of many interesting examples and several more general theorems. It is now Blue's turn, but Blue is unable to move, and so the game ends and Blue loses. Red won because he got the last move. If we record the number of each move as it is played, we acquire a complete record of the game. In this case, the odd-numbered moves were played by blue, the even-numbered moves were played by red. In many combinatorial games, we identify the players as blue and red. Blue is sometimes called left. Red is sometimes called right. In domineering, blue always plays the vertical moves and red the horizontal moves. It is often instructive to go back and do a post-mortem analysis of the game. Here was the position after move 21. Here is the same picture in which the regions which have already been played have been whited out. In this position there are some territories in which only blue can play and others in which only red can play. We can score each of these unplayed regions from blue's perspective. The vertical 4x1 region along the eastern edge of the board will provide two moves for left. Although he might legally use up all of his advantage here by playing a single move in the middle, a good player would never do so. The vertical 5x1 region along the western edge of the board will provide two moves for blue. The 1x1 one one regions provide no moves for either player. Each of the five one by two regions provides one move for red, which can be treated as a negative move for blue. Adding them up reveals that blue has four moves remaining, but red has five. Since four minus five is a negative number, red can win from this position, no matter who must play next. In general, playing in a domineering territory in which your opponent cannot move will cost you a full point. So it's best to save your integers until the end. In general, it's always unwise to play on an integer unless you have no other legal moves. Going back one slide earlier, here is the position after move 20. In this position, each player has a total of five moves remaining. Whoever plays first will run out of moves before his opponent so this position can be won by whoever plays second. The player who must play first will lose because he will run out of moves just before his opponent does. Going back one move earlier, here is the position after move 19. In addition to the purely vertical and horizontal regions we encountered before, we now have a region in which either player can play. How should we account for this region? For the next couple of minutes, Let's call it X. Who wins if we play the game X all by itself? If left goes first, he makes this move and the game is over. Left has won. If left goes second, right makes 
his only possible move, to which Left responds. The game is then over, and Left has won again. So no matter who plays first on X, Left can win. And we say that this territory, which we call X, is advantageous for Left. It is greater than zero. Who wins if we play the game X minus one? If right goes first, he can win. If right goes second, right can win again. So we say, no matter who plays first on X minus one, right can win, and we say that this territory, which is X minus one, is disadvantageous for left. It is less than zero. Since x minus 1 is less than 0, we conclude that x is less than 1. We've shown that x is greater than 0 and that x is less than 1. Whence we suspect that 2x is somewhere between 0 and 2. 1 is also between 0 and 2, so we next ask, how does 2x compare with 1? To answer this question, we investigate the game x plus x minus 1. Suppose left goes second. Right will take one corner, and left will then take the other corner. Right and left will then each take their integer. So this investigation shows that with good play, left can win. Suppose right goes second. Now left will take one corner, and then right will take the other corner. Left and right will then each take their integer. So this investigation shows that with good play, right can win. So either player going second can win. Whence we say x plus x minus 1 is equal to 0. Adding 1 to each side of this equation gives x plus x equals 1. So if x is a number, then it must be a half. Going back to the position of our game after move 19, and now treating this position as a half, we now have a net total of 4.5 minus 5, which is negative, from which we conclude that right can win no matter who goes first. The game we have just shown began on an empty 8x8 eight eight board, but many other starting positions are possible. We're going to try to understand them all. Some starting positions are composed problems. Some, like this one, have linguistic or artistic meanings. The word domineering has 11 letters of eight different kinds. Its winning strategy can be found by analyzing the value of each of these components and then figuring out how to add them together. That example is too hard for our present purposes. So I'll instead end this segment with a much easier word, pi, P-I-E. Let's watch a game played from that starting position by two players of average skill. Red played the first move in the middle of the E. The regions of value zero can be ignored, so we'll delete them. Blue responded. Red then played the top corner of what was once an E. Blue responded in the bottom corner. Then red took the top corner of the former P, and blue took the last remaining corner. The value of each territory is now an integer, and we can easily compute their sum, which turns out to be zero. Against competent opposition, whoever moves next from this position cannot win. In this case, that's Red, who lost the game. Here's the record of the first six moves of this game. Did both players play as well as possible? The ambitious student may wish to ponder how to analyze this game. From the initial three-letter pi, who can win? Does it matter who plays first? If not, should the winner be left or right? Or, if it does depend on who plays first, should the winner be the first player or the second player? We've now seen two complete games, one starting on an empty 8x8 eight eight chessboard and the other starting on a composed position spelling out the word pi. 
In the next section, we'll continue backing up our postmortem analyses of both of these games. We'll try to find points where the losing player could have won had he played differently.